Well, with us this morning to review this morning's papers are broadcaster Pete Price and the author and academic Joanna Williams. There they are. Very good morning to you both. Thank you for joining us. Um, Joanna, I think we're going to you first uh, with the front page of the mail. Um, the man tipped to be the new chancellor in a Liz Truss government, Quasi Kwarteng, uh, is saying help is coming. Of course, the cost of living crisis being very much the thing at the forefront of people's minds whilst the Tory party's ripped itself apart in the last few weeks with this leadership contest. Tell us more. Well, in a way, I wish I could. The story is frustratingly lacking in detail, um, but you're absolutely right. The cost of living crisis is everywhere in the news today. It dominates all stories, it seems to me, in, in one way or another. Uh, and I think people are becoming, obviously, people are becoming increasingly panicked about how they're going to cope with um, the coming winter, but, but uh, you know, really the, the rest of their lives almost, um, with, with all the talk about spiralling costs in every single area of our lives and inflation rising it's all very very scary for people so on the one hand it is reassuring to know that help is coming but but we, we seem to be expected to just take this on trust um, there are no details as to what form this help is going to take uh, my, my worry as well is that any immediate plans to to kind of give some money extra 200 pounds here or 300 pounds there 150 off our council tax 400 pounds on our fuel bills it's all very short term you know we, we really need to be looking at both short-term help for people you know people do need immediate money in their pockets to help cover the cost of their bills but we also need to get to grips with the long-term crisis as well and actually look at getting cheaper fuel bringing prices down on a much more long-term basis and i have to say even though the headline you know the, the big help is on its way and the is is underlined I'm sceptical. I don't think there, it, I, I, I'll believe it when I see it. That's, uh, I hope there is a plan, but I believe it when I see it. And Pete, I might just get your thoughts on this as well, if I may. Uh, you and I first met in a Greg's in Merseyside a few years ago. And I think it's fair to say that um, many people who live far away from Westminster uh, don't feel that their needs are heard and many of those people who need the most help don't have the loudest voices. What are you hearing up there? Yeah, um, uh, people are frustrated, people are angry and people are also uh, being misinformed. It, it seems to be a fear factor with so many stories these days and it seems to have started from the days of the pandemic when people were there isolated and watching and reading all the time. What bothers me about this is that you've got a, a feel-good story, but uh, as Sean says, there's no, no bones to it in any shape or form. It's just a story. And the problem is uh, a bigger problem. I just come back from Singapore, um, and they've got problems over there uh, with uh, their bills, uh, their cost of living it is worldwide it isn't just us and there is no easy answers in any shape or form which just takes me on to the sunday telegraph front page um pete you also picked out the story that liz truss is planning to halt the nhs doctor exodus how much substance do you find in the plans there I think, I think what's worrying about this is I would admire the lady and any other politician far more if they were truthful about it. We've got a thousand deaths now, um, all, I think it's every week, because of the backlog. It's, it's not just the doctors who've got problems over their pensions, apparently, uh, because of red tape, it means they're working for no reason because they're paying for their pensions. Uh, so it doesn't make sense what's going on. I would love her or any other politician to be honest about it. The NHS is still an amazing situation. I used a hospital not so long ago and they were tremendous the way I was treated. Um, there are isolated incidents and there are staff who are working themselves to death. But we are also out and about bringing staff from other countries and taking staff from there. So we're getting more staff in. Our staff are exhausted and tired. Um, I just wish politicians would be honest. We've still got one of the best systems in the world. Believe me, the costings abroad in some of the countries, and some countries have got nothing at all. We are very, very fortunate. But I just wish 
they would be honest about the facts. And Joanna, the Sunday Times on their front page, they're talking about uh, the cost of tuition fees for students at universities, potentially an, an increase on the horizon, which will be horrifying to many students who at the moment simply can't afford to live at university. I mean, yeah. I, I listened to a documentary on the radio the other day. It was horrifying what some of them are going through. Absolutely. And again, this is just an, another example of how these costs filter through to every single area of our lives. I mean, it seems to me there's quite a lot to unpick here because what universities are saying is that in order to keep going, um, even just offering the level of service that they are at the moment, they would need to charge UK students closer to the £24,000 a year currently being paid by international students. Um, I, and you're absolutely right. This is going to put university out of the cost of most students or students under our current finance system well, will end up never ever paying back these loans that they get you know they'll, they'll be in debt to substantial sums of money each month for the rest of their lives and that has a knock-on impact on their capacity to take out mortgage to have children and to do all the things that you'd want to be doing as an adult further down the line um, but you know you've got to ask it raises two other questions uh, in my mind at the moment we're being told that that one in five students in undergraduate students in the UK uh, is an international student now this is a, a record number um, the number of British students this year is said to have fallen by 13%. So essentially what universities are doing is they're taking foreign students for their money. It seems like I'm sure many of them are very talented as well. But the, the foreign students become a source of revenue and, and they're essentially squeezing out British students. You know, I, you don't have to go back that far. Go back to kind of 2015, the run up to Brexit. And universities were sounding the alarm bell then. And what they were saying was that Brexit would mean the end of international students. There would mean no international students wanted to come to UK universities at all. Um, well, clearly that's been proven wrong. So, I mean, in some ways, this is a success story of, of sorts. You know, students are still very much wanting, foreign students are still very, very much wanting to come to British universities. But we do need to um, ask about the impact this is now having on places for hardworking, youngsters in Britain. Um, you know, the, the idea of putting up fees to these levels, I, th I think it, it beggars belief and it will infuriate a lot of students, particularly students who've spent the past two years and even up until very, very recently, not having much of a university experience at all, being taught predominantly via laptops in their bedrooms, have had a lot of the things that they would normally expect to be able to take part in when they go to university actually cancelled because of, of lockdowns and campus closures, which I have to say my own experience of, of um, two of my children being at university during this time, it's, it's not what they wanted, it's not happy, and, and these, they, these restrictions have carried on a lot longer, it seems to me, on university campuses uh, than in many other parts of life long after people have been able to go to nightclubs and hang out in shops, universities carried on imposing restrictions. Yeah, there's not, there's not much in the way of good news in the papers this morning. I apologise, it's all quite bleak. Um, Pete, just while we're talking about this cost of living crisis and, of course, the um, energy price rise, with uh, it now forecast to hit as high as £6,000 a year by the spring, which is just extraordinary, uh, libraries are going to offer offer shelter to people who can't stay warm at home. Tell me more about that from The Observer today. Um, well, I love the fact they've put libraries and then in, underneath museums. I'm glad they put muse museums underneath because museums are usually cold. So <laughs> I couldn't see myself going there. It's, they're saying they're going to be warm shelters in the winter. Uh, they're offering the place recently. We had um, in the papers that people were going on buses and travelling on buses to keep warm. It's a bigger picture. It's a bigger problem. And who's going to heat the museums and who's going to pay the bills for the libraries um, it, it's sort of you know it, it is worrying we keep getting the energy profits thrust in our faces which doesn't help and by the way this fear factor which I mentioned before and I'll mention it again is killing people older people are dying of fear 
because they're reading how are you going to survive in the winter. Um, you shouldn't be going to libraries and museums to get warm. You should be going to libraries to enjoy the magnificent gifts they've got there of the books and the museums have got beautiful, beautiful exhibits and it's incredible. I, I find that it's sad. We'll catch up with you both again next hour. Thank you so much and we'll see you in a moment.